it and then I will take the presenters one by one. Otherwise, I will speak for too long uh, presenting all these people. So, Margaret, uh, the floor is yours, please. Thank you for being here. Okay. Well, ladies, gentlemen, dear colleagues, um, hello, everybody. Good afternoon. It's um, a great pleasure for me to be with you today. Um, as, as Jan said, I'm here on behalf of my Director General, uh, Wolfgang Bircher, who's taking part in the, uh, in the super trilogue for the CAP reform today. And, um, and otherwise he, he would be here himself. So I would like to say thank you to the organizers of this event for, for, for initiating it. Um, I think it's a very important webinar to have. I think we need to have more of them. Um, my name is Margaret Bateson indeed. And uh, in fact, I, I'm only in charge of four rural development programs, not all of them. <laughs> There's 120 or so of them. And I deal with the programs in Czech Republic, Slovakia, Hungary, and Romania. Um, I'm also responsible for social inclusion and rural broadband files in DG Agri. And uh, at the same time, I'm coordinating all of the equality and discrimination matters within the DG. So therefore, and, and because of the social aspect of the portfolio and that the health and the well-being of people uh, working in the area of agriculture and living in rural areas is very much in my area of interest. So I'm, I'm happy indeed that this event breaks the silence about the very sensitive topic of mental health of farmers and agricultural workers. Um, and it's my strong conviction that really we have to speak about it, we have to talk about it and look jointly on the ways how to improve the situation. I think everyone I know from the US has a therapist, but you know, nobody I know in Europe admits to, to having mental health, health issues. So I think the, the first big step is talking about it. So for just over a year now, we've been suffering from this current pandemic. I mean, it's a health crisis, the like of, of, of what we haven't seen since Spanish flu. And very few of us have seen that. And, uh, and all of a sudden, from one day to the next, we've been forced to abandon our normal way of living. Um, physical isolation became the most efficient response to the virus. And, and this is a way of living that is alien to us as, as human beings. And, and possibly all of us, or certainly I did, uh, experienced this fear of the lack of food and um, how, you know, how the situation would, would evolve. It was like these, you know, en end of world films that you see. And uh, I remember a couple of weeks into the lockdown, going into a grocery store and seeing empty shelves. And I will never forget the anxiety and the fear that I personally felt at the prospect of not being able to buy enough food to feed my kids, my family. But I have to say those fears were unfounded, apart from the, the first few weeks of not being able to buy a toilet roll and uh, having a bit of a shortage of rice or pasta, it, really the shelves filled up very quickly. And, and that was because of the people working in agriculture, our farmers who are the first link in the agri-food chain. And, and they kept working under extreme pressure, psychological pressure and physical pressure uh, during these really extraordinary times uh, since the beginning of the pandemic and, and still throughout the pandemic. Um, and they're the ones whom we would really wholeheartedly like to thank for keeping the food coming to our grocery stores. But even under normal times, I mean, before COVID, managing a farm was uh, a challenge and will continue to be a challenge. Um, the farmers are under constant pressure and they face really the daily challenges of farming, which go much beyond the usual obligations of running a business. Uh, you have the financial management of the undertakings, uh, including sometimes very difficult access to loans. Uh, you have the fear of, of not being able to make ends meet every month. Uh, you have your prices constantly squeezed by agribusiness and by the, the big supermarket retail, retail chains. And um, then they have to make all of these efforts in, into respecting all of the environmental and veterinary standards. And then even in spite of those efforts, the criticism uh, often unjustified of the impact of farming practices on the environment and climate change is, is really you know, leveled so much at our farmers' doors. There's the burden and stress coming from extreme and unpredictable weather conditions, increasingly so in recent years. And, and this can wipe out much of a year's work in, in, you know, in less than a week. Um, there's also the loneliness, the isolation of living in rural and remote areas for some of the farmers. Sometimes the, the younger people have gone to the cities and it is the older ones who are left alone. Um, and then also in rural areas, I mean, there is a big issue of the lack of social support services uh, and even sometimes essential services, uh, basic services. And, uh, and not forgetting the big distances that need to be overcome just to, to bring your kids to school or to go to see a doctor or just to get to the local, the local store. 
So these are some of the examples. And, and I haven't lived in the countryside since I was a little girl. And I mean, it's, it's a long time. And uh, I'm sure I haven't even begun to refer to the full range of the daily challenges that are faced. And now with this uh, pandemic and the rules of social distancing, the normal support that people would get from within their rural communities has been disrupted. And the access to the support, support services has become even more difficult. And those difficulties do take their toll on one's own one's health, including your mental health. And, and even those of us who are teleworking from our, our nice warm home offices with our secure jobs, we, we too have felt some pressure and seen the toll on our own mental well-being and, and the mental well-being of, of our colleagues. So I can only imagine that the pressures are amplified for really frontline workers like farmers. So I, I would like to assure you that the European Commission is concerned by some of the really alarming developments in the area of mental health. Um, there's a, a 2018 report on the state of health in the EU. Uh, this was carried out by OECD and EU. And in, it included a dedicated chapter on mental health. And it makes a strong case for promoting mental health, preventing mental illness and improving access to treatment. And it presents uh, various data on the impact of, of society. So looking at this, I, I saw that mental health problems affect about 84 million people across the EU. Um, and the consequences of mental ill health come to will cost the EU over um, EU countries over 600 billion euro a year. And, and that's more than 4% of uh, EU GDP. Only a third of those costs reflect spending on healthcare. Uh, 280 billion is, uh, represents the indirect cost to the labor market due to the lower employment and participation and the lower product productivity. And the remaining 180 billion is spent on social security programs. So clearly mental illness, uh, which is often invisible and um, too often silent, has a very high cost, not just at human level on the various individuals and their families, but at financial level on, on all of society. Um, there was a, a study published in 2019 by the Commission's uh, Joint Research Centre on the impact of loneliness on the uh, mental health of individuals. And um, it noted that the loneliness phenomenon affects rural populations in particular. Um, they, they spoke about uh, 75 million adults, European adults. Um, they only meet their families or friends most once a month. And around 30 million uh, European adults frequently feel lonely. And, and they noted that it affects all age groups. I, I thought it would be more for the older age groups, but in fact, it is all age groups. In particular, young people in rural areas can feel very isolated. Um, the significance of loneliness for individual well-being and social cohesion uh, shouldn't be underestimated. And they have a they they attach the mortality risk of loneliness as being comparable to that of obesity or smoking. Um, some other evidence that I saw when I was looking, uh, because I mean, to be honest, we we haven't dealt with with this issue a lot, um, uh, so I really did have to do a little bit of research. And, and according to the EU confidence barometer conducted by Copa Cogeca last year, 30% of German and French farmers um, are reported as feeling demotivated because of agribashing. Um, and then the Nordic Labour Journal published um, in 2016 the results of a survey of suicide rates by occupational groups. And this revealed that suicide is 10 times more common among farmers than among librarians. Uh, and with, with agriculture, fisheries and forestries being all sectors with very high suicide rates. Um, and then in the 2010 to 2011 um, period, the French uh, survey on Santé Publique, um, it found that the French farmer suicide rate is 20% higher than that of the general population. And for the, uh, the dairy farmer, uh, cattle farmers, the rate is 30% higher. So obviously agriculture is a very stressful uh, a sector. It's a very stressful uh, occupation, which um, which puts a lot of stress on the mental well-being of, uh, of its participants. So the European Commission as a whole does attach great importance to health, uh, mental health and well-being of all the citizens, including agriculture workers and farmers. Um, and as you know, we are we are now shaping this this new face of the common agriculture policy. And in my unit, because we deal with uh, social inclusion, we do our utmost to ensure that a wide range of social issues are duly considered. So just like in the, the last programming period, the CAP will continue investing in the development of services in rural areas. 
and we will continue supporting the member states who want to implement projects because we can't implement the projects we can't even force them to do it but the ones who want to implement projects that address issues like adequate psychological support to farmers or have cooperation and communication activities uh, for, for issues such as well-being these we will support um, we've already had a, a number of successful projects um, in that area and we will continue building upon those achievements and, and I, I can talk also to the, uh, the ENRD to see if they will, I think they have run some events on mental health in the past and perhaps we could do so again in the future. And of course the CAP supports farmers through the various area-based payments and rural development uh, investments um, in, in order to help stabilise farm income, which is really one of the, the main uh, overriding objectives of the common agriculture policy. Um, I'd also refer to the vision. Uh, we were talking about it a little bit earlier. Um, uh, it, it's, we're, we're close to finalising it. We will be taking account of the, uh, the big uh, event that was held in Brussels this week. Well, sorry, held, held virtually this week. And, um, and basically the, what, what the vision aims to do is prepare a response to the general lack of insufficient um, and or lack or in, insufficient provision of services and uh, basic services and support services in rural areas. And that would include uh, psychological support services and counseling services. So this week in the, at the very beginning of the vision week, uh, that we're running in Brussels, we, um, we presented uh, the outcome of the public consultation uh, that we ran in the autumn of 2020, where we asked a lot of questions about, uh, about rural areas and what people wanted to see in rural areas. And one of the questions was, um, what characteristics of safe and vibrant communities would make rural areas most attractive in the long run? And the highest response um, that we got to that question was 59%, was and, and this was for good quality support services. Uh, we asked about um, the extent to which people felt left behind by society. Um, overall, um, out of, of all of the respondents, 61% said they didn't feel left behind. But 58% of the respondents who came from remote rural areas said they did feel left behind. And that the reasons for this were the worsening infrastructure and services, the declining income and lack of economic opportunities, and also the lack of attention, political attention in particular, to the specific needs of rural people. Now, in my unit, um, we do our utmost to mobilise the financial interventions also outside the agriculture funds, including the European Social Fund and uh, the European Fund for Regional Development. Um, anytime we are consulted on an initiative, we always ensure that the rural dimension is included and that the specific problems of rural um, areas are, are mentioned. And there's off, very often an intersectional um, aspect to that. And, and our aim is to raise attention to, uh, to rural issues and rural problems in other policies and in this way enhance the extent to which the investments in, in, into the, the, the social support services in rural and, uh, and remote areas can be increased. Um, the Commission's DG Santé is also uh, supporting member states to, uh, to address the, the burden of mental health is uh, issues. And um, they, 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 they did say that they didn't have a huge amount of information on the specific situ situation for agriculture, and they will be very interested, I think, in the outcome of our discussion today. And uh, under their third health programme, they're addressing mental health as a priority issue. Um, and they're, they're doing this via implementation of, a, of good practices, which have worked in some other member states, and uh, there's some funding available in order to, to, to enable the sharing of good practices. And of course, there are lots of good practices out there in some of the member states. Um, in, in the country I know best, which is Ireland, the, the Farmers Association uh, points out the importance of talking about mental health, which is, is for too long has been a stigma in European society, and I think maybe also in the, the rather traditional and sometimes very masculine agriculture sector. And uh, the IFA website directs readers to the National Office for Suicide Prevention and to the Mind Our Farm Families uh, phone line. It's a, a, a sort of a dedicated suicide and self-harm phone line, which puts, puts farmers and their, their families in the, the direct contact with a, a, a trained therapist. And Chagas, of course, also uh, discusses coping with the pressures of, of farming and orders, practical help uh, for dealing with the administrative and financial and tax issues, and uh, gives uh, advice on how to, to stay in good mental health and, uh, and 
and, and I, for me, crucially, it, it discusses mental illness in a clear and non-judgmental way. Um, and I, I really think we need to do more of that. Um, as I mentioned, the ENRD is a great place to look um, at interesting and innovative projects that have been successful in other member states. Um, and I hope I pronounced this correctly. It's the Varavoima Farmarule project in Finland. Uh, this recognized that uh, poor physical and psychological well-being, fatigue, depression, have been um, have been become much more common among the farmers and their family members. And uh, the idea behind this project is to help farmers to to give them some psychological support sufficiently early in in the in the in the illness in order to prevent the situation from getting worse. And there's a, they they find that problems can be well resolved so often by discussing solutions, by sharing information, and and working together. And uh, and this organization or this project, should I say, has provided uh, personal assistance to over 350 farms and more than 600 farmers and family members. And it has been replicated now across Finland. And I think the big the big important lesson that, uh, from, from that project was the, the, the importance of networking. Um, and this one was funded by the uh, co-funded by the uh, the Rural Development Fund. And as a reaction to COVID-19 in Sierra Norte in Spain, the local action group uh, set up groups of volunteers to make masks and gowns um, for, to help the, the medical profession, but also to check up on older or isolated residents uh, in, their, in their areas uh, by phone and via Zoom and Skype in order to help people who were suffering from isolation and loneliness. And then I can tell you that in the trilogue discussions, which in fact are going on today, on the CAP uh, strategic plan regulation, the Farm Advisory Service has been tasked with uh, providing social support. We specifically mentioned now, I don't think it was in the past. And this will uh, ensure that member states can get EU funding for trained counsellors for the local advisory offices, which can then, of course, advise and support on the issues of mental health to the farming community. So I'm, I'm coming now to the end of my intervention, and I would just like to say that we see the importance of the social services and the organisations like the ones represented here today, who provide a whole range of support to farmers and the rural population. Um, we all know it would be very difficult to cope with all of these challenges without the very important work that uh, is carried out uh, by you. And I would also suggest, if you haven't already done so, that you contact the managing authorities for the social funds and for the rural development funds in your member states uh, to see um, to, and, and also to, to put pressure on them to uh, propose interventions uh, in their strategic plans um, or their operational programs, obviously, for the social funds um, and uh, to see if there's something there that you can draw on for help. And, um, and also ask um, if the member state has included civil society organisations dealing with um, farmer well-being or mental health organizations in their national partnerships. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, um, I would just like to, to by concluding, to, to, to say that we, we really do stand in solidarity with the EU farmers. We in DG Agri, we do our utmost to support them, to defend them uh, against um, you know, very much, uh, sometimes a lot of outside criticism. And, uh, and to give support for their situation. The Commission can't do everything. I mean, we try to provide a framework and then it is up to the member states to design and to program their interventions. And, and many of them do already, but I think some could probably be encouraged to do a bit more. Um, so I'm very glad to be here with you and I look forward to listening to your exchanges on, on this topic, um, which I will take back to my, my colleagues in Brussels in DG Agri, uh, also in DG Sante and Employment and to Mr. Bircher himself, who, who asked me to let him know um, what was, was, was happening here today. So you can, you can count on our support to the extent that, <laughs> that we can give it. So thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Margaret, for an excellent introduction. And actually, thank you for bringing us all the way back to when we were all scared that there wouldn't be. I, I had forgotten that this initial scare when the pandemic hit us. Can we, can we feed our families? And I, I, really, I really support your notion that it's, People have been working constantly and securing the whole world population has been fed during this pandemic. And it's quite, it's quite fantastic that they have managed to do that. Um, so thank you very much. And I would like to give now uh, the floor uh, to um, 
Dr. John McNamara uh, from Ireland. So you were talking a little bit about Ireland. We will get more into this. Uh, uh, Dr. McNamara works at the Irish State Agriculture and Food Development Authority, where he works on national health and safety extension specialist. Um, and he's also an associate professor uh, in extension in farm health and safety at School of Agriculture and Food Science in Dublin. So um, you, you are, uh, Dr. McNair, you are interested in both research and in applying uh, your knowledge with the extension community. So we are looking very much forward to your presentation. The floor is yours, thank you. Uh, great, uh, no, thank you very much for your introduction and uh, compliments to our last speaker from the European Commission on, on our very uh, wide ranging and positive remarks. Uh, I'm joined uh, by my colleague, Dr. Uh, David Meredith, who is a social geographer and with whom I work. Uh, now, I work for Chagish, our logo is there, and uh, I will explain in a few moments. I'm also connected with uh, University College Dublin, uh, and interestingly, uh, our, our, our predominant uh, al alumni is none other than James Joyce, the, the, uh, our famous Nobel laureate. Now, in Ireland, uh, we have a very strong uh, extension uh, system, ACIS, you know, Agricultural Knowledge and Innovation System. And, uh, you know, we have a very strong uh, agriculture, agricultural industry and that. Now, Chagish, you know, we're into research, advice and education, you know, but we liaise also with, you know, many organizations. Uh, you know, and policy regulators, the media and businesses. And our sole, our sole function is to support uh, farm families, you know, in their livelihoods. Uh, and, you know, that includes economic welfare, but it also includes uh, social welfare. We were predominantly, uh, you know, family farming nation, maybe 90, uh, 95 percent of that of uh, farms are, are family. Uh, most farmers are self-employed. Um, uh, you know, we're a grassland country. Uh, our farmers are, are getting old. We're seeking to get younger farmers. The average age is 54. And, uh, you know, our, our average farm size is about 32 hectares, which is, is small. Sorry, apologies. Uh, now, uh, I have three elements to this talk, the introduction which I have given, uh, and uh, uh, the next uh, uh, component I wish to, to deal with is a specific uh, lecture uh, by a study we've completed a few years ago, uh, and uh, the third uh, area is to talk about our current projects, and all our uh, projects and studies, uh, everything I'm going to deal with is been, has been public, uh, published and is available on the web. And I have the web links indicated in my, in my talk. So this study, which I'm going to focus on, is uh, about uh, the role of financial threats, so social support, anxiety and work stress in, uh, among dairy farmers and their expectations of, of injury. Uh, now, Chagish, we work very strongly with many uh, universities, uh, University College Dublin, I mentioned, University NUI Galway, which is on our western seaboard, and the people I worked with there uh, were Amelia Fury, who is a psychology master's, uh, Dr. Dennis O'Hora, who is a psychologist, uh, Mr. S uh, Dr. Stephen Kinsler, who is uh, uh, an economist, and Mr. Chris Noon, who is a psychologist. Now, we were dealing with farm stress, you know, so, so that's the first thing. Uh, and we were dealing with financial threat. And, uh, you know, there is a paper dimension to agriculture in Europe. So, uh, you know, stress and mental health is what we were dealing with and what the causes of it were. Now, uh, we we're also focusing on, on uh, farm injuries. And, uh, you know, that's an issue in Ireland. We have made some progress with younger farmers, but we still have 20 fatalities per annum. Now, dairy farmers have a high uh, injury, fatal injury rate, and uh, you know, they, uh, you know, there is a high illness, you know, health illness rate among Irish farmers, 
Uh, and, you know, for instance, 56% uh, of farmers uh, suffer musculoskeletal disorders, which is also associated with stress. So as an organization, we are very much pursuing the total health model, you know, that we're interested in promoting safety, but also health and also mental health. Now, regarding this picture, I'd just like to clarify that, uh, you know, we've made a lot of progress in a lot of areas in, in Ireland and virtually all tractors since the 70s, 1970s, have rollover protection structures. You know, this is not an Irish uh, picture uh, of, of a tractor is what I'm saying. Okay, the research questions, uh, do, do, does financial threat and farm, uh, and farm stress affect mental health and expectations of injury? Uh, does social support provide the protective effect against financial threat and stress? And does mental health mediate the effects of financial threat and farm stress? Now, uh, we have the, uh, a sample in this study of 121. Uh, you know, I gathered a lot of them myself. It's a convenience sample among dairy farmers. And basically, the farmers are younger than average, mainly married or uh, in a partnership, larger farm size, uh, higher levels of education, uh, they're predominantly, we sought to recruit dairy farmers and, you know, they're predominantly dairy farmers and they're predominantly in touch with extension, you know. Uh, now, the measures that we applied then, and there was quite a, an array of measures, uh, but we economic pre predictors, which were to estimate income and level of debt, uh, financial threats, uh, we used a financial threat scale and, you know, for, you know, for all the measures where we could get one, we used a validated uh, scale or a validated instrument. Uh, social uh, support, a multi-dimensional multi scale of perceived uh, social support, and then me mental health, depression severity measures, and access to generalized uh, anxiety disorder. And I think that, uh, you know, this is the benefit of work, working in a multidisciplinary way that you can use uh, a range of, of methodologies uh, and scales. Now, with stress in farming, we used the, the Edinburgh uh, Farm Stress Inventory, and, you know, that is related to uh, farming bureaucracy, finance, isolation, acts of God, or predictable, unpredictable events, personal hazards, time pressure. And then we used the farm safety and health belief scale also. Uh, and uh, you know, that talks about susceptibility and also about the benefits, uh, the barriers, the, the self-efficacy and the severity and finances, you know, they you know they're related to farm safety and health beliefs. Now I'll give you the results as quickly as I can. Uh, does financial threat and farm stress affect mental health? Uh, and expectations of injury? Well, the answer is yes. Uh, financial threat it, it affects both, both, both these dimensions. Does social support uh, provide a protective effect against financial threat and stress? And the answer is yes. Uh, and uh, does mental health uh, mediate the effects of financial uh, threat and uh, farming, farm stress? And the answer is, is, is yes also that, uh, you know, but, but stress has, a direct, uh, has direct effects on injury expectations. Now, uh, I think we have, a, uh, we developed this structural, edu edu uh, structural equation model uh, from our study. And, uh, you know, I think it's quite an elegant model, but it basically shows that farm stress, you know, which is non-financial affects mental distress. Financial threat, you know, and, and these are anything with an asterisk is, is significant, affects mental distress. Social, dispo, social support is a minus and the arrow is red, so it's going in the opposite direction really. So it mitigates against stress, uh, mental distress. Now, mental distress has a very strong relationship with depression and with anxiety. Uh, and it also leads to farmers' expectations of injuries. And uh, farm stress leads directly to, to uh, uh, an expectation of injury, whereas financial stress did not. 
okay, additional findings, uh, and this comes up in a lot of studies, time pressure, work organization, workload, though, that, that kind of territory uh, uh, had a score of three, uh, you know, as a source of stress, followed by farming bureaucracy or paperwork or the business side of farming 2.8 unpredictable events and you know climate change is out there so there are unpredictable events 2.5 personal hazards you no know, injuries is sourced on that 2.5 finance 2.4 and isolation 1.7 the lowest uh, you know based on the uh, concept that there is high levels of social support out there Right, uh, discussion, Sub uh, subjective financial worries and job stress contribute to uh, mental health and injury expectations. Objective measures of income and debt did not reliably uh, uh, predict these outcomes. In other words, the issue is subjective and anxiety pr predicted expected injury rather than depression. Now, farmers in the study, uh, you know, that they had low stress, uh, uh, financial worries, anxiety and depression, and, and a high level of uh, uh, social support. You know, the farmers were taking advantage of, of, of both local and national supports uh, uh, and were uh, predominantly looking forward to expanding their business. You know, in this study, you know, milk quotas in, in Europe ha had been removed. So they were expanding at the time we did the study. And farmers uh, who are having personal and financial difficulties are hard to assess uh, access, uh, but need most help. So we're trying to get to the hard to reach group. I, I just like to make the point up that, uh, you know, social supports and uh, uh, kind of structures to help and support farmers need to be there in good time. You know, just when the crisis strikes, whatever the crisis might be, you know, that, you know that it's difficult to get systems in place quickly. Um, so further discussion, subjective worries and job stress uh, contribute to mental health and injury expectations. Objective measures of, of income uh, and that do not reliably predict uh, the, these outcomes and anxiety predicted injury rather than depression. Sorry, I got that. Okay, they, this is a group of our farmers and uh, they're in a discussion group. This is my colleague Liz Duffy here in the front. And uh, I, I should have said that predominantly Irish farmers are male, like about 85% male, but we're seeking to get female engagement increased and that. But we also find that discussion groups are extraordinarily helpful, both in technology adoption, but also in social supports. Now the paper I'm discussing uh, is available on Frontiers. You know, if you put in Frontiers and Ohora and uh, Farmer Stress, the paper will come up. You know, it's it's publicly available. Now the third and final part of my talk is about current studies and extension in health and mental health that we're engaged in in the moment. And I'm just going to summarise the, the, these and give a link to them. The first one is that we're very active in health promotion, and I think health, uh, you know, health promotion uh, is crucially important, uh, you know, in the longer term. Uh, one initiative that we did was produce a health booklet with our National Centre for Men's Health. You know, it provides a, a platform for promoting mental health, uh, for promoting health, including mental health. You know, we circulate it nationally and we continue to circulate such materials nationally. Uh, there is a paper available on this, uh, you know, it's, it's in the Journal of Agromedicine and the link is available there. And the lead author is uh, Dr. Aoife Osborne, who did a doctorate with both myself and David and other colleagues in the whole area of farmer's health. And maybe a point I would make is that you need to uh, grow your, your human resources regarding extension and, and, and research, you know, uh, you know, in good time, you know, to, to, you know, to have people, the talented people available uh, to, do, to do very valuable work. Uh, a second study that we have done is a qualitative study of, uh, uh, of suicidal behaviour among men in rural Ireland. We call it pain and distress in rural Ireland. Uh, it's on our web and the link is there. Uh, no, we find it finds that quality of life remains high, 
or people have varying experiences. Uh, su suicidal uh, actions, they're associated with mental illness, uh, economic difficulties, and marital uh, separation, among others, uh, and low econo socioeconomic status. And there was gendered attitudes to, to mental health and uh, mental distress and help seeking. And I think, as said earlier, uh, um, you know, males uh, had a higher uh, level than, than females. Uh, the research was carried out by Dr. Uh, uh, Maria Feeney for her PhD study. Now, currently, we are studying cardiovascular health, and you know, we issued uh, the attached report uh, last July, if I last June, if I recall it. Now, uh, high, both high levels of cardiovascular mortality and indeed cancers have been uh, found in Irish farmers in a very authoritative study. Now, we have uh, uh, an, evaluate, uh, an, uh, an evaluation in progress, and we're seeking to improve farmers' cardiovascular health behaviours through health coaching by phone, uh, by uh, an electronic means, by texting, and we have a control group. Uh, now, within the study, uh, we found, and, and this is last uh, recent, in the last year or two, uh, you know, that uh, farmers' experience of, of stress was uh, uh, often or very often in 13% of cases, and to some extent in 62.3% of cases. Our PhD candidate, she's here in the middle there with, with the scarf, uh, is uh, Miss Diana Van Dorn. Right, we have a further uh, study in place uh, at, at the moment, and it's bespoke our speci spe specific training uh, for farmers uh, on, on health. And the link is there. Now it's called on firm ground. So that really means we want to put firm ground under, under farmers. Uh, we're adopting a training of trainers mod model where we're going to train up uh, uh, 24 extensionists. Uh, training is conducted in, uh, uh, is being provided by Engage, the National Men's Health Training Network. Their logo is at the top of the document. Uh, trainers, uh, uh, training will then be provided by the trained trainers to uh, uh, all Irish extensionists for, for one day. And uh, they will also receive support from the Men's Health Network. Now, we have an ongoing evaluation of this uh, project and our PhD candidate, uh, who is, is the prime author of this document here, is Mr. Connor Hammersley. So I think that is a very exciting project and it fits in what, uh, with what the EU commissioner, uh, commission representative has said. And, you know, we, we regard this project as a start. We have other plans, you know, to, to build on this project and to evaluate it and build on it once it's completed. Now, we have two further studies uh, in progress, and my colleague David Meredith is a supervisor uh, of these. Uh, one is sources of stress in farming, and uh, uh, it's based on a national survey uh, of data. And, you know, uh, Mary Brennan is the PhD candidate, and she plans to submit her PhD this year. Now, uh, when the results of that are out, we seek to include uh, stress indicators in our national survey uh, annually. Now, another uh, current study is related to isolation and well-being of farmers. Uh, and, uh, they, you know, uh, w w these issues are connected up to quality of life and mental health outcomes. And the PhD candidate is Alexis O'Reilly. And that study is being uh, conducted uh, with Maynooth University, while the uh, sources of farmer stress study is being conducted in association with University College Cork. So to conclude, Chairman, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of work in progress, but a lot to do. I think the work is multidisciplinary. Uh, I think we should base our work on solid research and solid uh, knowledge development and knowledge transfer and knowledge uh, 
um, sharing. Now, uh, we obviously we we wish to promote health and mental health among both males and females and among the whole population. Uh, but we believe that a gender sensitive approach is correct, namely that men respond in in uh, uh, you know to, to health promotion methods in in, in different ways to uh, to females. You know, females are, more, are far more engaging engaged in the issue. Uh, men are are. are uh, are not and you know our director of the national men's health center you know has done a lot of research in gender sensitive, sensitive health promotion uh, you know there's a media role for uh, promoting perceptions and you know for changing perceptions and you know removing stigma as has been mentioned uh, you know so you know related to both health and mental health and i believe the two must go together uh, and that, so, so, so I think the media and we need to change perceptions. Now, now it is multidisciplinary, as I said, but extensionists such as myself, uh, you know, we can assist uh, farmers, particularly in solving farmers' problems. And with training, we can signpost, uh, you know, we can assist farmers and signpost them towards health and health gain in association with health profession, professionals. And, you know, I've mentioned at the start that I'm involved in the School of Agriculture at UCD, but training of agriculturalists at every level, at undergraduate level and in-service training is required to make progress. Uh, no, thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Dr. Namara, for this. And, and I, I could see from the chat that we have participants from all over the world, and I think it's really really interesting and encouraging how much research you are putting into this. Normally, when we talk about agriculture research, it's about the agronomy, not about the, the we, we tend to forget the farmer and, and look at the farm or his animals, the plants and the animals. And I think it's very encouraging to see how much you're actually doing to support and understand what is the well-being of farmers. So very encouraging and very interesting and uh, we will definitely share all the links to all these interesting public uh, the already uh, completed ones and all the ongoing ones we will follow up with so thank you very much for that interesting uh, presentation i will now uh, like to invite uh, from another perspective from germany uh, regina etzinger schönberger who will talk uh, who is responsible for mental health services and coming from a insurance agency for farmers. So from a completely dis, uh, different perspective. But before going there, maybe I should, uh, is there any questions uh, in the chat that I haven't seen specific questions to, um, to uh, John, to Dr. McNamara? Ingrid, is there any questions I haven't seen? Not here in the chat, but people are free to use both uh, okay. the chat function or the Q&A as well. Yeah. And if they don't come now, we can always address them uh, later. Thank you. So uh, thank you for that. Uh, yes, please, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A or in the chat. Uh, and then I will give the floor to uh, Regina. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, welcome, everyone. Um, I'm, thank you for inventing me to talk to our healthcare office in agriculture. And um, the, the climb is in balance with us and our um, special office um, also go for mental health. And so I hope everyone can hear and see the presentation about my person. Um, I'm social pedagogue and staff at SVLFG uh, in the Department of Health Office. And some fast facts, uh, we are social insurance for agriculture, forestry and horticulture. And we deal with the whole spectrum of social security, health, pensions, workplace accidents. And our focus is on people working and living in agriculture and we, um, um, our status as a public body and some um, numbers 
um, about 1,5 um, million members in, in employers' liability insurance association, association and about 6,000 uh, members in health insurance and about 800,000 members in pensions insurance. And um, so um, we have different and topic specific offers and I will give you only an overview to um, every um, offer we give. And there are a variety of different workshops with main focus on stress management. Um, perhaps I will um, give you an example what um, was the first um, thing or the first um, uh, moment we get an idea that it's necessary to get uh, tailor-made solutions and services for our farmers. And there was um, a survey uh, in made that found that the regulated transfer of the farm is a particularly sensitive and burdensome aspect in agriculture. Um, means um, that our um, people, we um, get um, some, um, I need the word, um, we give them um, support, need other uh, support than general people. And so um, stress has um, many um, different um, uh, issues in, in, in behind, and so you get other solutions. And you can see there is also um, a special um, offer called business transfer, a health topic. And we look uh, for the health topics when they uh, give the business to the younger one. What um, have they uh, to do? Uh, what's their role in the business now? What can they do? Um, so it's a very important uh, workshop and many farmers um, use it to um, get um, more information about the health topics on business transfer. And we also had a multiple, multiplicator workshop conducing uh, conversations after traumatic events because our farmers um, are also in a um, special social position and they always uh, look after other farmers and they should get some um, tools to do a good uh, communication with people after traumatic events. And we have training and recovery weeks for caring relatives um, because uh, much more um, people in um, living in, in the rural area care their relatives and they need um, out time or the time out um, to um, stay care uh, to stay uh, healthy and so we um, did the offer and there is also a time out for caring parents uh, they can get for one week to a special hotel and get a program and um, uh, support from us and um, care tandem is a very special uh, offer so um, they can bring their um, care people with them and we look after them and uh, they get a special um, support and uh, special um, ways to to handle it um, we also have online courses and the idea is simple help for self-help and our online courses help your policyholders with the most common mental health problems um, the help is quick easy and anonymous 
and they get a personal coach. Uh, it's a trained psychologist and um, they can use this for about uh, six months. And the different tools for different needs are uh, stress course, depression prevention, insomnia, chronic pain, um, the part drink less, panic, or diabetes and depression. And we also have telephone support and it's an intensive individual case coaching. And um, they support people with high stress levels and personal crisis. And the telephone support by a personal uh, the telephone support is by a personal coach, uh, also a trained psychologist. And our objective is together they can find ways to cope better with stressful situations, crisis, or fears in order to sustainable maintain a better quality of life. And in case further assistance is necessary. The coach provides advice on further assistance offers and looks for local suitable measures. And um, the project I work in and um, look for it is socioeconomic advice and mediations. And the support offers for problems that can't be solved without professional help and have a potential negative impact on employees' health, like conflicts within the family or interpersonal conflicts. Um, it's our experience that conflicts in family has also, um, um, or it's say contact also the business and conflicts in business also contact the family. And it's very important that conflicts in family um, get solved because it's um, a very important factor of success. Um, when they don't get the support um, in the family and they can't talk to each other and get an opinion about the way they do their business, um, it's also um, a problem in success for the business. And so we give support. Um, and also it's ne necessary for some of our farmers um, to get uh, support in financial and structural difficulties. Um, and there we started with a cooperation between Bavarian Farmer Association. And um, in the moment is a pilot project. Uh, we started in July 2020. And um, in January 21, we get the first survey of evaluation started. And our plan is further cooperations with agriculture associations across Germany. Um, the farmers uh, we talked to uh, who um, used our support, everyone um, was fascinated and get uh, or, or give positive um, feedback to the uh, support. And so we hope that we we'll, can do it to a regular um, support and it will go over the pol uh, pilot project. And then we also has, uh, have the support hotline for crisis. It's the support in acute crisis. Um, there is an experienced psychologist give, to, give help to our policyholders, and it's available around the clock the whole year, and they can use it in such a way. And so I will thank you for your kind attention. And our um, idea is uh, it's better to preserve health than to care diseases and I agree with all talkers today um, what the problems and the situation of the farmers are and um, that's our answer the, to, 
to get solved the problem. And so we give that support to our farmers in, um, in yes, to, to get um, a better way of life for them. And um, I can give my, my email to you and you are always very welcome to reach out to me in case you need further information. I don't have too much uh, numbers and facts. I only want to give a short overview about our idea. We get uh, the problem uh, solved. Yes. Thank you very much, Regina. And I think this is a very interesting thing that the insurance uh, business goes in and say, you know, what can we do to solve this problem? Uh, and, and although you don't have so much figures, uh, it would be interesting, uh, you know, if you can see an is there an increase in the number of, of people using the, the, the service? Is it something that, you know, I know that it's anonymous, but, but how, do you, how do you advertise for it? And do you see that over time the, there's an increased number of people using the service? Could you reflect on that? Um. I, I try to to get a, a serious number, um, but it's um, I think um, um, about 800 um, um, people use it um, a year, about 800 a year. Um, I think it's half half men, woman, and um, we started um, in 2018 and um, the, the way is it get more, more people use it every year. And um, if you are interested, I can look after the exactly uh, numbers and I'll give it to you. Uh, thank you. No, yeah, it's it's interesting. You know, for me, the interesting thing was if it was 100 the first year, 500 the next year, 1,000 the next year, if it sort of was something that, that people sort of became aware of and, and saw a need for. I, I'm sure that it is the top of the iceberg that is yes. calling to you. There's a lot of people who doesn't use. So it would be, so for me, it was just interesting to see if you saw an increasing demand once the service is available, is it something that people were using? Um, okay. Our farmers are really interested in the teams and they always give the feedback we should give more power into mental health uh, offers. Thank you very much indeed and thank you for a very good presentation. Unless there, I see, I don't see anything in Q&A, so I will move on to the next uh, presenter. And um, here we have uh, three presenters from a, a European network uh, on rural solidarity. Uh, the first presenter will be Sana schmidt Menig from Germany. She works as a managing director um, and she holds a master in environmental protection and agricultural food production. Um, and after her, Isla Irvin will come from France, uh, and she works at uh, Solidarité Payon and support workers accompanying farmers uh, in the Midwest region of France. And the last one will be from Belgium, uh, who is a psychologist working uh, uh, amongst farmers living in Bologna. So three presentations from a European network. And Sana, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Carl. So, yeah, I'm just trying to start my presentation. I hope you can see it now. Is it full screen? Yeah, nice. <laughs> okay, so thank you for the introduction and hello to everybody out there. My name is Jana Schmidt Mehic and I work for the BAG, Familie und Betrieb, which means actually farm and enterprise and is the, yeah, let's call it the umbrella organization for farm and family counseling and farm helplines in Germany. And yeah, I would like to present you our 
um, services now. I will try to be quite, yeah, quite short in order to also be able to present the European network later. So first of all, I would like um, to describe you our understanding of what farm family counseling is. And for us, this is actually an offer for farming families, but also for rural families um, and rural family enterprises. So we aim to be a really easy, easily approachable yeah, service actually. And how we do that, I will explain you in a minute. Um, so the offer is really for farming families in times of important decisions, um, either in family life or in business issues, as well as in personal economic and family crisis. The first farm family counseling in southern Germany actually opened in 1988 after a study group went to the US uh, during the farm crisis and got an idea of what actually a farmer helpline is. And we saw that in Germany, this is definitely also something that is necessary. So why is that? It's not just because most of the families in Germany are still run by families, but if you look a little bit more into yeah, the farming world, then you will see that actually farm, yeah, fa uh, family farms and enterprises, those are two very different systems, you know, like the system of a family and the system of an enterprise. They have the same actors, but they follow very, very different yeah, logics and rules, actually. So if just imagine you are yeah, a father or a mother and um, also a boss, it is a very yeah, conflicting, it can be a very conflicting situation with the younger generation, for instance. I would like also to make the kind of provocative statement that actually farms don't have problems, but people do. The people who work and live on the farm, this is where it comes to in the end. You know, when you look into many situations, and I'm pretty sure you will know that from your experiences as advisors, it's not just about technical problems, but often it comes to the question how are people dealing with situations? Especially because family and enterprises are very intertwined or intermeshed, and this can be a strength, but it can also become a very big weakness when, for instance, communic communication doesn't really work. And also farms and farming families, they're in a permanent coping with development tasks. And this can be, in the end, pretty exhausting. So what we offer is, first of all, a protected and confidential setting. What happens in the counseling stays in the counseling. And this is very important for us. Um, so we also offer mediation in conflict situations and moderated discussions between family members. We try to support um, on the path of clarification, of clarifying goals, in order to be able to develop strategies. And this is something where it's very important to understand that it's not the counselors who come to the family and say, okay, let's do it like this and let's do it like that. But the counselors try to support and to, to yeah, kind of show the path to, to the families to find the actual right way for the person, persons in need. So this non-directive and participa participative approach is very important for us. We like to give our clients the chance to discuss very urgent and um, yeah, just, just, just sorry, decisions that are um, yeah, that give them a hard time with a neutral party. So this is also another strength that we bring to the table that we have the ability and we have a really great network to refer to families when they need special um, advice. For instance, as we just heard with the 
SVLFG, we have very good connections, um, then the organizations in their region are very well connected. We are nationally very well connected and internationally. So it all comes back to how can we help the farmer best. And we realized actually that some farmers, for them it's especially beneficial if an agriculture advisor and a farm family counselor when they work together in a certain case. So for instance, in the federal state of Hesse in central Germany, we started the so-called complementary approach, approach, which means that, as I said, the agriculture advisor and the farm family council go together and yeah, look at the situation that is, that is there from different perspectives and try to have an holistic approach to the situation. And as I said before, we try to be a really easily approachable um, yeah, um, offer. And what helps us with that are definitely the counselors. So they're not just good listener, listeners, but also very empathic and respectful towards our clients and their work-life context. This is because the counselors themselves come from an agricultural and rural or agriculturally related, back, related background. So they understand the very specific struggles the clients are facing. Each counselor is trained and we work after a systematic resource, resource oriented approach and a client-centered approach, which means that we really look at the, at the person but not just as an individual, but in the context of everything that is happening around this person or the situation uh, he or she is in. With the formation also comes a wide knowledge of psychosocial skills, which also means that the counselors know their professional boundaries. So this is an important point. We are not a psychologist or we were not doing uh, psychotherapy. We're more, let's call it a first step. And if we see that there are um, yeah, mental health problems that need treatment, we can address and advise our clients to um, yeah, certified professionals. And another thing that makes us yeah, special and unique <laughs> is that um, we work with employed counselors, but there are there are additionally also volunteers with very different backgrounds, trained volunteers, there are sometimes farmers, we have psychologists, we have family therapists, we even have bankers and pastors. And the counseling, so we were talking about in the seminars before about the stigma of having somebody, you know, coming from a counseling service. And when you see a car at the farm, the neighbors might know, oh, something's happening there. So this is why we work with um, two different approaches. If the farmer wishes the counselor to come to the farm, it is most often possible, or it's also possible to have counseling in the, yeah, just in the rooms in the offices of the counseling service. The services are um, distributed around Germany and actually there are 21 independent counseling entities and seven help, uh, help hot, yeah, hotlines actually. And the, as I said before, the umbrella organization represents them nationally and internationally. The services are mostly financed by the Protestant and the Catholic church, but in the respective federal states, they're also co-funded by the ministries of agriculture. And the most frequent topics people address us with are actually conflicts between generations, partnership or marital problems. There are also questions about operational procedures, then farm and enterprise succession. A lot of farmers face debt and financial distress but also family entanglements. And what we observe is that especially work pressure and workload and the, yeah, the physical problems and the psychological problems that come with that, that they are actually on the rise. Another thing that is a very yeah, urgent topic or an upcoming topic is the question of generation change. And this is because 
40% of the farm owners in Germany are older than 54 years, as we heard in Ireland, it's quite a similar situation. And the question is, of course, who will take over the legacy, especially in a farm family, in a farming family, it's a family legacy that needs to be handed over. And so here we have process support or we offer process support through special counseling offers workshops and seminars and there are different yeah let, different areas we focus on so one is the farm succession from the viewpoint of the handing over generation so the older generation and the viewpoint of the the taking over generation the younger generation and the focus here, I mean, you can focus on a lot of things in this very yeah, tricky, tricky area, um, but we try to focus on relationship and communication because often, yeah, the whole handing over process is actually a quite emotional process. And there are special offers for potential successors and non-family uh, non farm succession. And I just wanted to show you very quickly, very briefly. Um, so this is from a flyer from our from one of our organizations. It's um, the offer, the counseling offer uh, for people between 18 and 35. It's called hashtag challenge future struggling between family and your own vision. And another point that is offered is the round table for a non-family farm succession. Um, it's still absolutely a taboo in, in Germany to think about giving the legacy actually to somebody who's not family, but sometimes it's just a pure need to, to look after somebody else because there might not be a family. So this is an offer which is very, you know, casual, a casual setting where farmers just get together with people uh, who aspire to become farmers, actually. So this was a very, very short glimpse, actually, into our work. And I would like to thank you for your attention. And if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Uh, Sana, there's a question if you can translate in English. Uh, I guess it's some of the, maybe the publications in, from Milan in, uh, in Serbia. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, you speak very well English, so I guess the translation is the, maybe the presentation. Uh, no, maybe he's still typing the question. There might okay. be a question. Just have to find coming. it. Mm -hmm. Ah, okay, good. Because I don't see it yet. Okay. Okay. I, I haven't seen anybody putting questions in the q and I'm wondering if it's not working for people. I mean, as a panelist, I can't put anything in, but I don't know if other people can put anything in. And Sana, did you have a second presentation or are we moving on? We are moving on and later on, Alice and I will come back to the European network. So Isla Irvin will be presenting now, right? Exactly. Okay. So uh, maybe we will catch up with the questions while Milan is uh, writing, and then I will give the floor to, uh, to Isla. Please, the floor is yours. Hello, and uh, greetings from France. My name is Isla Irvin. I'm a support worker for Solidarité Paysan. And um, we'd like to begin today by taking a look at mental health and suicide of farmers in France, beginning by looking at some of the figures regarding mental health. Um, depression affects over 16% of farmers compared with just under 10% of the general population. Burnout is also an issue with some 35% of farmers being at risk of burnout compared with about half of this figure for other self-employed people. And farmers work long hours. 77% work 50 or more hours in France per week, and 21% work more than 70 hours. And looking now at uh, some of the factors affecting mental health and 
contributing to suicide risk, as we've seen overwork as an issue, with lack of downtime away from the farm, creating high stress and reduced perspective. Uh, lack of sleep is a problem, addiction can also be an issue. Um, feeling disempowered with no control over one's destiny when we talk about um, climate, for example, um, and the life and death of farm animals. Uh, being overborrowed, submitted to intense financial pressure. The breakdown of relationships, which might be separation or divorce. Conflict, which might be within the family with neighbours or creditors. And inheritance pressures, which are quite specific to farming. If you're the third or fourth generation farmer and things are not going well, you can meet quite a lot of intense friction, perhaps, within the family. And these factors lead to social and professional isolation. And as farmers are stoic and uh, very resilient, they often have difficulty expressing problems and feel ashamed to ask for help. Looking now at um, some figures relating to the suicide of farmers in France. The most recent figures we have uh, go back to 2015, as um, there is always a large delay in these figures being published. In that year, there were 372 suicides officially registered, which is more than one farmer a day. And we know that this figure is underreported, as often suicides are registered as accidents at work. Eight in 10 cases concern men, and some two thirds of farmers who die by suicide are in the 45 to 65 year age group. Often there is no prior attempt, and death is frequently by hanging or firearm. And as Margaret mentioned earlier, the dairy farming and cattle rearing sectors for meat production are the sectors most affected in France. Looking now at some of the aid mechanisms to help prevent suicide of farmers. Uh, in each department or county, there is an administrative support pod. Um, and this support pod is made up of members from the Department of Agriculture, Chamber of Agriculture, the Social Security organism and also um, other farming, other people concerned with farming, um, like bank managers and um, advisors. And these support pods uh, try to put in place measures to alleviate pressure on individual farmers. Agri Sentinelle is um, a new government initiative in France, and this is to encourage farming leaders to become trained um, in recognising suicide risk. Of course, there are the health services, uh, hospitals, psychiatric units, um, and there are also units um, um, for um, suicide prevention. There are charitable and publicly funded associations uh, like ourselves. There are also helplines. And um, very importantly, there is the MSA, and this is the French state run social security um, organization for farmers. And they have several measures in place. Um, there is a suicide helpline. There's respite aid for stressed farmers. There are training courses to regain confidence amongst other measures. However, there is an issue. And we asked the question, is this a French particularity? This, the state social security system for farmers has two conflicting roles. It is both a creditor reclaiming social charges from the farmer, and it is a protector um, providing the social security services. Um, and this compromises trust and the ease of access for farmers to the various support measures that have been put in place for suicide prevention. And we frequently hear farmers saying when we visit, um, how can we be expected to phone the helpline when it is the MSA that is bringing the bailiffs to the door and taking us to court for late payments? Moving on now to speak about our association, Solidarité Paysan. We're a national association which defends and accompanies farmers in difficulty. The association was established in 1992 by farmer groups in response to the inclusion of indebted farmers in the judicial collective procedure system, which meant that farmers were now eligible 
to ask, for example, for a judicial redressment or um, a judicial safeguard or just judicial liquidation. The intervention of our association is free of charge and is available to all of France's farmers. And there's a mistake here because France has more than 85,000 farmers. It counts some 400,000 farmers, so apologies for that. So we're made up of around 1,000 volunteers and 80 employees. Um, we have 35 local branches throughout France, and we help some 300,000 farming families each year. Our proximity to the farming community is uh, via local hubs of trained volunteers and employees, um, and we ensure accessibility of support to farmers, reducing isolation and exclusion. These hubs have local knowledge of farming issues and local production types and create local partnerships and have the advantage also of being part of a national network with shared experience which strengthens these local branches. Our support, uh, our approach to support rather, is a global approach. We intervene as a support unit of two accompaniers or support workers, as at least one of these being a farming peer, and we'll look at that in a bit more detail in a minute. We intervene at the request of the farmer. We listen without judging, our support is confidential. And the farmer remains master of his or her decisions. We don't take their place. Our support covers several aspects, economic, technical, family, judicial, physical, and mental health. Without having a quick look at the particularities of our association. We always intervene as a pair of accompaniers or support workers. Now this gives the advantage of having two pairs of eyes and two sets of ears to give two interpretations of any given situation. And this has a um, reciprocal vigilance regarding the ethics of the intervention. Have we done enough? Where are our limits? Have we gone too far? The pair also provides mutual support, the psychological protection of each other through debriefing and analysis. And for the farmer, the intervention of this first little working group, in which he or she plays a central role, helps to combat feelings of isolation and improve self-esteem. And we can, we can find different types of pairs, either a volunteer with an employee or two volunteers, for example. What is important is the presence of a farming peer in each of these small support units. This has the benefit of bringing a common understanding of the profession and the related pressures and builds a relationship of confidence with the farmer. Often the peer volunteer has also experienced difficulty and de-dramatizes, can de-dramatize the different situations um, and the solutions identified. For example, a judicial redress. And just finally, looking a little bit at the collective action of Solidarity Paysan. There are different types of collective action within the network, political, technical, social, to inform decision makers and the general public, and to defend the interests of farmers in difficulty. And we find this at several levels, local, regional, national, when lobbying government, for example. And finally, looking at some of our collective local wellbeing initiatives, that we set up to help farmers. We have Café à la Ferme, when groups of farmers get together at each other's farm and have an informal chat over a cup of coffee. There are confidential discussion groups, which may, for example, be attended by a psychologist to give emotional guidance and support. Um, there are volunteering for different building or creative projects, social gatherings and days out. And the objectives of these are to reduce isolation and loneliness, integrate the farmer into a network of farming peers, boost self-esteem, and allow the farmer to regain his or her voice and be heard. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Isla. Very, very interesting what's going on in France. And, and I'm, I'm particularly happy that the last two uh, presentations, or actually the last three ones have been very much, you know, hands on what are you actually doing when you are uh, talking to uh, a farmer? What what actions do you need to take? And I, I, 
appreciate the, the, the thing with the two persons, because it can also be, if, if it's a person in very much a distressed situation, maybe it's not, I mean, if you are physically present, it might be very nice to be two people sort of, because otherwise it might get too intense. Uh, so I, I can really see the advantage of doing that. Some very, very sort of practical hands-on things on how to do it and some do's and don'ts uh, like having the insurance company to be the, the ones to, or the, the one that send you bills to be the one that you go for counseling. Of course it doesn't work. I mean, it's, it's, it's very clear that you can't have those two services in the same place. So thank you very much. Uh, there is actually a question now. Uh, can you see it or should I read it? Uh, it's a question about how necessary it is uh, for the counselor to provide support. Uh, knows very much about the farming background. We have heard that several times that the counselors had a farming background. How important do you find that? Uh, uh, well, speaking for Solidarity Paysan, we find that it's uh, very important um, and that it is very advantageous for our um, interventions um, because there's always this, always this question of trust and confidence. And um, it really does create a relationship. Once there is a relationship and there is free expression and listening and understanding between the two sides, we can go forward and we can really help. Yeah, and I mean, there, there is, and I think probably a global suspicion among farmers about city people, right? So if, if somebody who doesn't understand and appreciate the, the life of farmers comes and try to talk to them and tell them something, it, 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 you're starting in a difficult situation because there's suspicion and distrust uh, from both sides. So I think I, I would agree uh, with what you're saying there. Thank you very much uh, for the presentation and please hang up for, uh, stay on, sorry, for the discussion in the event. Um, Sana and Alice, um, the floor is yours now. Uh, Carl, if it's okay for you, I will uh, present Agricol, uh, which work in Belgium first, and then Zana and I, we will present the European Association Sure, please go ahead, uh, Alice, the floor is yours. Thank you. So, uh, is the sharing is working? Mm. Yes, it needs to, yeah, perfect. Okay. So, uh, thank you for the invite, uh, yeah, for inviting. And um, I also apologize for my English, so please don't hesitate to ask me to repeat uh, if something is unclear. So I will uh, uh, talk to you about Agricole Wallonia ASBL. Uh, so it's an association, Agricole takes action in the southern part uh, of Belgium. It's called Wallonia. It's, uh, it works among uh, farmers and their relatives in Wallonia. It has been created in 2005 2006 as an association. Uh, it fulfills a public interest mission and it received a financial aid from Wallonia. Uh, Agricol provides individual and collective support such as training or prevention. But in this presentation, I will focus on the individual support part. So here are a few statistics. In uh, 2020, um, Agricole works among um, 287 farms, 755 people, farm, uh, farm, farmers and relatives were supported. And um, we received uh, two, uh, 2,413 uh, phone calls through our um, helpline form. So here are a description of the farm agricultural support. Um, so mainly uh, it is cattle farms 
dairy and meat production, it represents 800% uh, of the farm we are working with. Many farmers are working alone and or sometimes with, um, with a family member, uh, spouse, parents, uh, child. Most of them are not registered to a social security service, uh, which prevents them from accessing uh, uh, health care support. And most of them have to face financial issues or debts in order to pay their uh, collaborators, uh, so such as um, agronomic suppliers, bank accountant, and so on. And most of them are also uh, overwhel overwhelmed with the uh, paperwork and uh, administrative tasks. All these uh, impact uh, the mental health. The um, everyday workload of a farm, uh, it is obvious on, uh, in a dairy farm, is quite heavy and extreme. Uh, such an intense workload increases uh, the risk of pacing organizational issues and poten potential burnout. Family and professional lives uh, are so tightly intertwined that conflict within the family are quite common. So uh, farming family members are sometimes trapped into a loyalty conflict. And as a result, the family is not considered as a, as a resource place anymore. And this is quite striking uh, when discussing the transmission of the, um, the legacy of a, of a farm, for example. The financial pressure, uh, debt, long-term credits, market, market price, uh, price fluctuation, Financial viability leads to a loss of meaning in their work. So such pressures increase the risk of depression, burnout, somatization, alcohol consumption, suicidal thoughts, um, isolation, withdrawal, or other psychological disorder. To face the issue of mental, uh, of, um, mental health, uh, agricultural work focus on uh, bringing a global answer to the farmers' issues while in the same time deconstructing stereotypes among farmers. So uh, this is our team. Uh, it's an uh, interdisciplinary team. We work, um, my colleagues uh, are agronomists, financial analysts, I have got uh, two uh, jurist colleagues. Uh, one is a telephone counselor, and uh, we we are um, five psychologists in our team, and we also work with a team of psychotherapists. So in practice, um, this is the way we work. So the request for help uh, needs to be addressed by the farmer himself. Agricol doesn't accept any request coming from a third party. The telephone counselor, um, it's a telephone helpline which is available uh, five days a week from 10 to 7 p.m. Mm -hmm. The intervention are on based directly at the farmer's place. Um, it's a team of two people detached on the field who visit the farmer in the farm. And uh, we work all along between regular meetings, phone calls, financial audits, counseling, strategy development, and so on. The approach we, we use is an approach centered on the farmer and his family. And um, we also use a, this multidisciplinary approach. It's also a case by case approach based on the farmer's needs. So our work is based on these fundamental values, fundamental values. So the first one is the global approach. In order to take into account the diversity of needs and the complexity of each situation, we explore the familial context, the history of the farmer, the history of the farm, the resource of the farmer, and we consider the emergency of the situation and the temporal um, reality of legal or financial issues. 
and we evaluate the current financial situation. We also work according to confidentiality and relation of trust. It is essential to move uh, forward with the farmer to get a better understanding of their current situation and to find a suitable solution. We also work with a network. Uh, we frequently refer to an expert from our network or from the farmer's net network. And it can be a lawyer, accountant, veterinarian, expert from agronomics uh, association, psychologist or therapist. We also um, uh, work in a neutral way and a political way. Uh, so all farmers are welcome regardless of their personal beliefs or farming practices, membership in an agriculture, agricultural union. It is also free of charge intervention and support in order to facilitate the request for help. So thank you for your attention. And here is my uh, contact if uh, needed. Thank you very much indeed, Alice. And I, I um, Sana, will you continue straight or I, I don't see any questions specifically to you, Alice. I, I think um, very interesting to see the same things uh, as that they are doing in France or similar things. And I also think very importantly, your last point that this has to be free of charge services. Otherwise, if, if that's a burden that they also, I mean, if you're sitting in this financial constraint, the last thing you want to do is to add to your financial constraints by calling some somebody where you have a tap that you need to pay. So I, I really think, and I, uh, I, it's very important. I think the cost uh, that society is saving by providing this kind of services free to farmers is really paying off. And I, I hope that the member states and, and commission, you know, really say this message. This needs to be easy, available, free of charge. Uh, uh, anonymous, confidential, and with people who understand the background of the farmers. Um, because the, the cost for society and, and for the families involved are just uh, so big, you know, uh, when, when farmers actually go with the, the either co uh, collapse or actually commit suicide. So this is it's a very important preventive investment uh, from society. Uh, yeah, sorry for all coming in there. Sana, uh, the floor is yours again. Thank you very much. Yeah, so I will just uh, share my screen now and Elise, you, you're going to start, right? Okay, yeah. good. Can you see the presentation? Yes. Perfect. So Sana and I will uh, introduce you the Rural Solidarity in Europe which is a counseling network for rural family enterprises. So what is a network about? Um, it is um, an exchange platform. It aims to rise, um, um, yeah, it is an exchange platform created in order to improve the national rural family counseling networks performances. And it also aims to rise awareness about, uh, about the difficulties met by rural and farming families within the public and authorities. It supports emerging counseling services for rural family enterprises in Europe. And it supports councils and initiate research projects of European scale related to the association purposes. So let me introduce you the members and board of the RSE. So uh, Solidarité Paysan, BAG and Agricole are part of the RSE. Here is Michel, Michel Courgeot from Solidarité Paysan, Laurence Leruz Agri, from Agricole, and Hartmut Schneider from the BAG, uh, who are the board of the RSE. So a bit of history. Um, so where did the wish to collaborate come from? In the middle of the 90s, um, Solidarité Paysan met the BAG in a project by the European Union uh, named SOS uh, Rural World about a phone helpline 
in this project, contacts um, with other European countries have been made too. And through this project, a good link was made between Solidarité Paysan and the BAG. There were some similarities in the way of working, uh, the values and uh, the mindset of the organization. On the other side, Agricole had some strong links with uh, associations of Solidarité Paysan of the northern part of France and the national uh, association. They had some exchange between psychological approach and legal and financial approach. The connection between the three organizations became stronger with a project focusing, focusing on the exchange of counseling practices in uh, 29. Um, so it was funded uh, by the Grandvit program. Teams of each counseling services um, met each other. Step by step, uh, thanks to mutual affinity and invitation trips, uh, exchange of practices, the idea to create the RSC network arose. There were a shared wish to formalize that was becoming a network to give a structure and visibility and recognition while keeping a warm relational dynamic. Uh, in 2017, uh, the, the RSC meet again around a new project and I will let Zana uh, presenting it to you. Yeah, thank you, Elise. So, um, yeah. I be, yeah, I, yeah, go ahead, please. <laughs> I was too quick. Okay, sorry. So, um, the question what is it actually that the network does? Um, as we heard, the exchange and knowledge ex exchange, learning from each other, is actually the most important thing about our network. So, what we do is that we create opportunities and spaces to do so. Therefore, we organize and plan meetings, seminars and workshop, as well as exchange and study trips. But we also want to know more about the livelihoods of rural farming families and their enterprises. So with this understanding, we, or yeah, we try to understand actually our focus groups better, um, the, cha the challenges they are facing and with which methods um, and interactions we can support them. And this is especially this point is where we can learn so much from each other. You know, in the end, um, everybody, all the European farmers, um, they face very similar struggles and it's very interesting how differently these topics can be approached. So with the information we gain, um, we conduct then the project, uh, projects, as Elise just said, for instance, the Agri-Resource. It's a project that is focusing on resources and counseling and agriculture. As we have heard today quite often already, there was this French study um, um, conducted by the Health Institute in uh, France, Santé Publique France, and it showed that actually among farmers, the suicide rates, the suicide rates are quite high. So as, or not just quite high, but actually it's the highest, it's the occupational group with the highest suicide rate. So in reaction to this shocking, yeah, findings, the RSE network decided um, to look a little bit more consciously into the topic of suicide. And we decided to try to yeah, find a little bit different approach maybe, not necessarily looking into the situation where farmers are already feeling completely overwhelmed and absolute helpless, but to look further into a more preventive approach. And this is where we realize that it, it's time to look more deeply into the resources of farmers. Because just in everyday life with all the uh, being so occupied with farming and family matters, often, yeah, just a question about how to recharge batteries loses completely its value or it's just not there anymore. So, with the help of the European Union and the Erasmus Plus program and program that supports education, training, youth and sport, 
Uh, and in collaboration with the LFE, um, an Austrian organization that was actually presented last week, we decided to create a training, a training workshop for farmers, but also for, for advisors and counselors, um, looking more into resources and how resource yeah, resource focused counseling can actually look like and how farmers can in their everyday life be a little bit more aware of what is helping them to recharge. So we wrote two workshops and a workshop manual that is available in French and German. And unfortunately, it's not in English, but we do have another offer in English, which is a little booklet and infographic explaining everyday practices to find strength and to find your resource, actually. And this is not just helpful for farmers, but of course, also for advisors and actually, in the end, for everybody to look a little bit deeper in what can we do, what helps us to find strength again. And I included you the download link where you can find it. And with that, we would like to thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions to the network or to each presentation, we are happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed for this presentation. Uh, very good. Um, I bet there are some general questions, but I think I will um, keep them for the general discussion and uh, because we only have one more presentation left as far as I recall and we are now going to Finland uh, to thank you for being very patient Ayla uh, in in waiting for us to give you time to speak and uh, we, this is also an insurance company like the one we had not like the one but like we had a presentation from Germany also. This is called the, the Pharma Social Insurance Institution Mela. And Ayla Erola is a project manager and support uh, at the support the farmers project. And it's uh, doing, of course, helping farmers. And she uh, also have a farming background from Finland. Uh, so you, you, you have the permission to speak as being a former farmer. <laughs> no, please. Ayla, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, I Sorry, I have to say the first that my, my internet connection is very bad. Uh, I hope you can hear something about me. And, and one correction, firstly, I am project worker. I, I'm not the manager in this project. And, and, <laughs> and, and I am really really happy that I can be here today with you and and uh, this is actually a very good place to be the last one because I have heard all those systems you have all around Europe and I have noticed that we have something something some parts that are the same kind here by us and um, well, the, actually, I, I think it's, it's very important now to give you some stories about what I do on a farm, because actually my eyes are on the same level with the farmer and, and we have the same kind of systems and things, but I, I am quite, I wouldn't say on the bottom, but, but, but my, my, my legs are really on the field here on, on the farms in, in Finland. And well, let's see if I can find. Can you see my recent presentation now? I hope. Uh, no, not yet. We still see you. Apologies. Okay. And you don't see me. Not. You no don't see. No, no presentation, presentation yet. You have to yeah. press the share screen. The green share, share screen. screen button in the bar. Just a minute, let's try. And then. Yes, and you just have to put it in present. Yeah, fantastic. It's okay. now. Yes. Yes, um, we have this project to help farmers in, in everyday life here. 
And our our company Mela is Farmer Social Insurance Institution of Finland. And we really provide comprehensive pension cover and social security to farmers in Finland, but also to reindeer herders, fishermen, forest owners, etc. And Mela is, of course, more than just a social insurance company or institution. And we are in farmers' life in, in very many ways. We also administer farmers' holiday and send in stand-in scheme, and we have many kinds of advisory services. And, and these different kinds of, of insur insurances, like you can see here. And from our homepage, you can find more information if you want to check out. And then we have this, this project to help farmers, and we have started in 2017. Finnish farmers uh, made a, together a big trip to Helsinki to the parliament houses in 2016. And that was the time when, when farmers were, were really, they had had enough and they, they were so deeply in crisis. And after that moment, the government noticed that we have to do something different now. And we got the first million to our insurance company to start this project. In this crisis package, there were also other things that were, were targeted to, to help uh, farmers, but, uh, but our project started in 2017. And I can so well remember those first, first months because we started something from nothing. We, we didn't first know what to do. And already in April, we knew that we had been able to do in four months something new and something big. We were actually on the edge to, to see and hear that because we could help farmers very easily, very quickly. And we were only four people, four, four persons on, on the field in Finland. And and that was a good start for us. And based on these good results, we have been able to continue the project all these years. And like we have been listening to that, farmers are under pressures. And I think that those pressures are very same kind in every country here in Europe. In our project, I think that the most important part of us is that we have this project work on the field, on the farm. And this is for all farmers in Finland who need help. It is available for everyone. But it is also uh, very important to notice that only farmer who wants to get help is able to get help. Because if you don't have yourself in, in your heart that idea, idea that now I, I really want to start talking about things and I, I want to make a change, then, then it is possible to find solutions and, and get better. And we are very easy to contact. So we have project worker in every province in Finland. We are 14 together now actually 11 person in, in, on, on the field and three person in, in the main place in, in Helsinki. And this, like, like I said, we are easy to contact. Uh, farmer can, can take just a phone call to us, can send an email, but very important is also our co-operators. They, they keep telling about us and our project and they have our brochures in the backs and, and, and they're in their emails. And we have been giving a lot of interviews, for example, to television and radio and, and newspapers. And also professional newspapers are writing about our project. And we have, I will be telling you about this, this work on, on, on the farm a little bit later more. 
But now I want to tell you about vouchers we have to buy expert services for farmers. And these are used uh, in cases when my help or project workers' help is not enough on, on a farm. This voucher is worth for 500 euros and one farmer can get even another voucher when needed. And by this voucher, farmer is able to buy expert services, for example, psychological help, psychotherapy or relationship therapy or work supervision. And I notice these are same kind things you have in other countries in Europe too. And this voucher is very easy to, it is just, just one A4 form, one sheet. I can help the farmer to fill the voucher and we can get it very quickly about, well, even in half an hour or maybe maybe next day it's ready and the, the farmer can start using expert services. We have given now about 3,000 vouchers for farmers. And the feedback about these vouchers from farmers meeting a psychologist or therapist, that is wonderful. One voucher for worth 500 euros, um, by that uh, farmer can meet therapist maybe five, six or seven times. And I have met so many farmers who had who have said that this one voucher, these few meetings made me like a new person. Now I'm I'm back again. I'm back again. People, many have have lost their joy of life, and and they they didn't know anymore what to do, how to solve out these problems they have. And one one. Farmer said that my my wings are not cut it anymore. I can fly again, and I think those those words are that kind that they tell very easily to us what what this means to 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 a farmer. We have also this early intervention, and we have a permanent permanent network. In, in our insurance company, we have started that already in 2010, more, also, so more than 10 years ago. But these days, we really educate our co-operators to make observations on the farm and to bring up these observations to discussions and also to assist farmers to get help. Because when, when the specialist or expert or advisor or authorities go to the farm, they have their own job to do. That, that special important thing, what they have to do on the farm. And they don't know how to start talking about if, if, if they see that nothing isn't anymore quite okay on this farm. What has happened? My my bells are ringing in my in my head, but but what is what is wrong on the farm? We are educating these persons now how to how to start to take take care or, or give give some help for the farmer. We also organize regional meetings and and work, workshops and and seminars. And in every province, we we can do a little bit different kind of things and for example here in the in the middle of Finland I have organized groups for men and women farmers and they have been talking together confidentially with a therapist and and organizing also some kind of, um, days where where maybe seven women are together for a whole day and, and they go to sauna and we have a therapist talking with them together and it is like a holiday for them but we take um, those difficult issues to our conversation and and give some something good for farmers during that day and here is listed what kind of problems or questions i meet on on a farm 
with farmers. And like we see, these are very same kind that you have heard of already earlier here. But there, there are so economical problems, but, but that what I mainly do with farmers is thinking about mental health, how they could go on better these days and how, how to how to go go on and how to how to find solutions to those problems in family or, or relationships and, and relationships between generations. And then I would like to tell you how how does it go when I I have a new client. So I get a phone call from from a farmer or it can be also that, um, for example, occupational health nurse or insurance agent or expert notice on a farm that something isn't wrong. And he asks farmer if, if they can together or, or expert can make a phone call to me. And he, I need in that kind of situation farmer's permission to call back to farmer. And when I take the first call to farmer, I have to be able to use 125% of my energy. My ears have to be really ready to listen what farmer has to say, and my heart has to be open. And that is very important that I have this farmer background and, that, and I can understand those problems farmer has. And sometimes when farmer is very exhausted, I can hear very much of crying. And, and there are people who can keep talking just for an hour without, without any break, because it is possible that I am the first person to talk about the personal questions and, and problems. And, and, and I'm not a person in a family, I'm, I'm a new person we have never met before. So it's so much easier to start talking. And after that, we make an appo appointment and I, I go to the farm. Of course, during COVID-19, we have also this phone call system and Zoom and te Teams and so on. But in normal life, I, I go to the farm. And on, during the first, the, actually, the first visit may take four hours, five hours. And when I am on the farm, I, I just first I look around and I, I think, well, what does it look like? Is, is, is here everything OK? How has things been taken care of? But uh, I have to remember that what I see, it, it may be quite clear that it, the truth is like that or it isn't. I, I, I can't really know that. And I try to scan that situation on the farm. We, we talk and we talk about family and, and persons and productions and animals and fields and whatever. Sometimes farm has only one problem, but very often we have all the problems together. There are financial problems and, and, and the grandfather isn't very nice anymore and he, he can't let the younger, 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 younger people decide and make their own decisions and the bills haven't been paid and um, mil, mil, cows are not milking anymore so good and it has been raining too much. And very often we, we are just me and, and the farmers on the farm. And if needed, uh, we can make that voucher. And when, when the situation is that kind that, that um, help for, for, the, for example, for relationship is, is very urgent and that is a very quickly way to go on. But we are searching certain professionals to help maybe animal doctor, advisor, financier, whatever, mental care. And sometimes I, I take farmer and we go together to see doctor or, or make an op appointment to a doctor for, for next days. And farmers are sometimes 
so exhausted uh, that they can't help themselves anymore. They, they need someone to tell what to do, what to, how to take these first steps, and what is the first step, and what, what shall we do after that. And it is always the farmer who makes decisions, but I am the person who is opening the curtains from the windows. I am trying to tell them that, okay, we can see the sun in the sky. Okay, there may be some clouds, but the sun is there. And we are searching the solutions together to the problems. And I, I am there to motivate a farmer to make a change because the change has to be made. We can't go on anymore this way. And I have written the, the last line there about my role. I am like a mother, I am like a teacher, I am like a coach, and I am like an expert. And we are very different kind of persons who are in, in this job in, in Finland, but everybody is doing that. In, in a certain way, and we all have knowledge about farming, but we have special knowledge, for example, about how to meet people or, or how, to, how to find those financial solutions. And now we have already the next step in, in our job. We have a pilot project of the work of the work ability coordinator service in agriculture, and I have started that now in in January. We have farmers, normally 50, 55 years old, who have these questions, and and this is now something special we have started in in three provinces in Finland. Thank you for your attention, and if you have any questions, I'd like to answer those. Thank you, Ayla. I think uh, you, you, you are a savior, and if you're a Christian, I will call you a guardian angel for the farmers. Also, you can add that <laughs> to, your, to your line of things. Uh, I, I'm, I think it was a very nice way to end with the with stories from, you know, what do you, how do you experience when you sit face to face with the farmer and, and what do you do? So thank you very much, for, very much for that presentation. Excellent. Thank you. We do have some questions now. Um, so thank you for those. Um, and I, I would open the floor to everybody now. Thank you to all the presenters and everybody can uh, chip in. Uh, so there's a question here from David in Ireland. Uh, to what degree the services that we have heard about is linked to extension advisory service and to what degree it's, it is, uh, yeah. To, to first question, to what degree is it linked to the extension service? Is it part of extension service or is it separate from extension service? If anybody wants to come in on that question. And, and also a, a, yeah, no, let's take that first one question at a time. Anybody who wants to say anything on this? Maybe greetings. I know it's my colleague David who asked the, uh, the question, but um, uh, you know, I think extension has to play a very strong role in, in the whole area of health or mental health. You know, now we in Ireland, that has not been the case in Ireland, I'd have to say, you know, but we are seeking to develop it further, you know. Um, that, that's the first point. Now, I think you, the essential characteristic of extension is trust with farmers, you know, and good interconnection with farmers. And I think, you know, we've got to leverage on that, you know, and we've got to always maintain that. You know, uh, now I know every country has a different model and, uh, and uh, compliments to all the speakers, but in Ireland, uh, you know, uh, extension can't do it on its own. Uh, you know, the health service is there and we have a comprehensive service. Uh, the challenge is to get farmers, male farmers especially, 
you know, to look after their health better and to uh, uh, engage with the health service, you know, long before a crisis develops, you know, so that when a crisis develops, they're in touch, you know, um, uh, that, that's the point I'd make. Uh, I think, could I just, while I'm speaking, could I just mention this the social ecological model you know, uh, we in a lot of the studies we've done, we've, you know, come back to the social ecological model, and and I really uh, agree with what a number of speakers said. Uh, you know, uh, particularly Eli, Eli, there lately. You know that you know the farmer is at the very centre of the of the whole ecosystem, and they are self-employed and they're they're their own bosses. You know. So I think we really have to influence them strongly, but there must be other supports around them, you know, uh, to make progress. Thank you. Thank you, John. Anybody else who wants to come in on this? Yeah, I would like to add that I think it's a very important situation actually to, yeah, to exchange and to bring all this advisory services, extension services, and the farm family uh, counseling together. Because in the end, you know, the biggest problem is, or our main target group are the farmers. And unfortunately, they do have their problems. And it should be our aim, our, yeah, our common aim, actually, to work on the situation together. Because, um, well, I think, it's very sad if, or let's not say sad, but um, everybody has their strength and everybody can, can put something into this discussion. So why not benefit from all this specific situation, specific knowledge and come together for the farmers in the end? So this is something that, as, as I showed in our presentation, is happening in Germany at the moment. There is something... Um, as I said, the complementary um, counseling or advisory system, but it's it's a, still it, at the beginning, you know. At the, as as you heard um, in Germany, we started quite early with the farm family counseling, and actually there were yeah some some restrictions or some um, yeah the question why why do you think you have to do that from from certain advisory. Um, yeah, advisory systems. They they didn't necessarily understand um, the necessity or felt as if this is a competition actually. And I think this is something that we really have to focus on to get this idea of competition out of our minds in the organizations. You know, in the end, the farmers can benefit from our services, and that should be our main goal. Thank you. Thank you very much for that intervention. I think also to the question on how is uh, extension linked to this, I think Ayla, you said it very nicely, you know, it's not always the farmer themselves that is actually capable of reaching out, but it is the people who interact with the farmers. And then that, that says there's something wrong here, there's some distress here, you need to pay attention here. And then of course you need the farmer's consent to move on. So, so, I mean, we have been talking based on some of, from the DFAS point of view, from our uh, networks point of view, that, that one of the things, as we talked a little bit about in the beginning, before we started this, the, the webinar, that one of the things that we are taking out from this is that we have this online learning platform uh, called the New Extension Learning Kit, and we would really much, very much like to develop a module on mental health based on the conversations that we have had in these four webinars. And as I see, if we can get to that extension officers broadly generally will be able to discuss, destigmatize, detect, you know, destigmatize, be able to talk about it. That's the first step that a dairy uh, extension officers is not afraid of asking the question, you know, not only how is your cow, but how is you actually? And and so and destigmatize it, but it, by talking about it, you are actually destigmatizing it, right? Uh, then they have meetings where the farmers meet, talk about, you know, oh, without saying, you know, we, 
I know this cousin of mine who had a mental health problem. There's always a cousin or something, right? When you say it, you don't never personalize it. And then also, you know, help farmers in what are the signs they have to look for, you know, because sometimes when, when animals are mistreated or when it, it looks messy on the farm, this is act can actually be early signs that the farmers is giving up. He can't cope with it anymore. She can't cope with it anymore. So, you know, being mindful of this early signs. And then if you see signs having in your toolbox, having the phone number, how do I call Isla? You know, where is her phone number? So, so discuss, de stigmatize, detect, and direct the farmers, where can you get help? I think if we can put that into sort of a training package, that can be sort of a global training package, which is customized and localized for the different countries. What, because the context is that there's so many similarities around the world I can see from this. And of course, there's local solutions, right? So the problem is global, but the solutions are local. So I think we need to work on that from our point of view. And then I will go, sorry, I gave myself a bit of time here. And then I will take the next question. So not only is the ministry, uh, not only is extension involved in this, but how is also authorities, uh, ministries, uh, policy stakeholders, is the health sector involved? And then and a supplement question from Margaret, to what degree of all the, is, uh, all the programs that we have heard from the different member countries today, to what degree is the commission and the EU involved in this one? Some of them I heard, one of them, the one you talked about, uh, Alice and Sana, was started by the European Union, but is now running without the European Union, as I understood it. So that's that's not fully without. But I mean, and we had one in the last one, we had one from Austria, which was also funded by the European Union. Uh, so definitely you you the union seems to be one of the ones who's, who who have seed money for this. And the question is, of course, after, after the project phase, who takes over? Who takes over the responsibility? Is it the insurance companies? Is it the farmers' organizations? Is it the government authorities? And, and when you start the project, have you already started having dialogue with these ones who can be the potential ones to take it over and finance it? Because it costs money to run these things. So I will open the floor with a lot of questions here. Sorry, it was a whole bundle of questions. Anybody wants to come in? Margaret has a hand raised. Just open your mic and start speaking okay, if you very want. Very good. Okay. So yeah. So just to say that, I mean, I had mentioned that, that the uh, Farm Advisory Service it, it is now um, has as one of its uh, areas um, that it, that it should give advice on um, social support, and and this would include um, some some sort of psychosocial support. So it means then there is budget to provide counselors counseling in and expertise in the farm advisory service so this is something you could you could ask in your member states about uh, about what what is available and uh, what the farm advisory service will do because i mean if if, if there's funding available from this from uh, from the uh, develop rural, rural development programs then then that would be very helpful um i mean also at the moment there's a lot of talk about the social dimension of the cap and this comes because the European Parliament has been asking to include um, a social conditionality in the cap, and they want to make um, the, the, the cap payments to farmers conditional on the farmer respecting the rights of workers, which of course is very laudable, but in, in, in many ways this would be yet another stress on the farmer at having to respect all of the social and the employment legislation as well, um, which, which can be very difficult. But it, whatever we do, I mean, there, there's there's a lot of discussion going on on this. Whatever happens, there will be an increase in the social dimension in the cap. We are looking at a number of ways of including it, and um, and there should be also possibilities for funding in cooperation and in uh, in in uh, information uh, provision, so that there, there will be ways for member states to to get uh, money in their programs for. Um, you know, maybe for, 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 for more seminars along this line, um, sharing platforms um, and, and ways of uh, cooperating and, uh, and sharing best practices. 
Um, and um, I really, I, I just want to um, applaud um, Elia and in particular, I, I find her, uh, her presentation extremely moving. And uh, I'm going to steal her if I can for a presentation in, <laughs> in DG Agri. Uh, because I want to actually um, organize, well, I, I plan to organize a number of seminars and trainings for my colleagues on how to um, take account of the social issues in their review of the CAP plans um, and how, what to look for, what to ask for. And, um, and this is one that I don't think we had really considered, to be quite honest. I mean, we, we looked at a, a number of other social issues, but not this one. So um, it would be really good if, uh, if I can steal her perhaps <laughs> and, uh, and bring her along to talk about this because um, as I said, I found her, her presentation uh, really powerful and, uh, and I think it would be, I mean, also all of the presentations were wonderful, um, but I think it, it woke me up a little bit to uh, the extent of the problems out there and the sort of counseling and, um, and, 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 and help and support that is necessary to give. And uh, I mean, I cannot guarantee you that member states will put the money where it needs to go for this. But um, I think if you're aware of what the funding possibilities are, and if you can encourage from your end, and if we can encourage a bit from our end as well, perhaps we can actually do something to, to, to raise the level of EU funding altogether that goes to this. So thank you very much. Thanks for bringing me to this. It really, um, it really increased my knowledge on the subject. I, I knew some little bits and pieces, but I've learned so much more. So thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you for being here the whole time. Uh, and, and also, I love the, the, your idea about vouchers. I think it was a takeaway from everyone, but mm. not only are there counselling, but there's actually, if, if counselling, if support goes beyond, again, the voucher gives you this that there's not a red tape, there's not a financial burden to go on. You're actually given a gift to move on. Uh, so I think that was a very good one also. We have two more questions before we close the session. We have one from uh, India talking about that the, the problems for poor farmers in developing countries might be very uh, different from the ones in Europe. And... Um, and that poverty itself is a very strong stress factor for people. Just the ability to survive from day to day is, is a stress factor. And then comes, you know, uh, weather uh, harsh weather incidents or whatever it is, the COVID lockdown, so you can't. I mean, in Europe, I think that the value chains have been able to move. But I know in countries like India, that was a very hard lockdown in the beginning. Uh, nobody could move around. We had the farm workers issues in Europe in the beginning, which I think was solved. Uh, so definitely, uh, and that's what I'm saying, there are, there are some similarities globally, but there's definitely very different problems locally. So, so whatever, we, if we do some, develop something training material, it always has to be adapted to the, to the local uh, situation. We can never sort of, there's not one, one size fits all here. Uh, and then there was a question uh, from uh, Michael Kriegler uh, to emphasize that what are the lessons learned and mistakes uh, from all the ones who have done a little bit. Some of you said it was a try and arrow. You were starting from scratch. So not only, is it, please don't only um, share your successes, but also all your mistakes. That's the one we learned from. And uh, and there's a tendency to always uh, present you all your successes and sort of hide away with all the mistakes that you did. And then it just means that everybody else will repeat them because uh, so it's very important when we do this sharing among us that uh, we also see what didn't work and why not. Mm. I, I see there's one. Yeah, uh, one uh, Margaret is coming in, but the peer to peer uh, that the farmers talk with other farmers about the health problem is, is really, really important. And, and I think, Isla, you also talked to this with the ladies going out for the day and things like that. Uh, and, and sometimes you don't stage it as let everybody meets to talk about our problems, right? But you create a room for it to happen uh, with another title that do this doesn't seem so scary. Okay, without further ado, I think I will 
like to thank participants for hanging on. And I would like very much to thank all of you presenters for taking time and being with us on a Friday afternoon. It has been a very interesting um, journey to take these four webinars. And I'm really, really happy that uh, there was immense pressure from our European partners to make one focused on the European uh, situation. And, and like Margaret, I really learned a lot today. So I appreciate, and I think we, let's keep this network running. Uh, Ingrid has, uh, wants to, so before I close from my side, Ingrid, maybe you can talk about where we can find uh, information, uh, but let's try to build a network between us. So extension and people who do mental health support to farmers keep talking together. Thank you from our side. Thank you very much. Ingrid, you over to you. Read my mind. That's exactly what I wanted to talk. Um, the other three webinars, they are available on the GFRS website, also on the GFRS YouTube channel. And this one will also be there as of next week, probably Monday. Uh, so please, we would really encourage you to uh, look at also the other ones. There's lots of interesting examples from other parts of the world, in case you have not seen it. Um, also with what Maesh talked about, you know, there's a lot of uh, issues that are similar, but also different and new initiatives that we could all learn from. Uh, we really hope to keep moving on this momentum. There's a lot of great engagement and GFRS will continue to work so that we can, you know, build on this and hopefully share resources, um, more and more resources that can support extensionists as is our, our core um group and then farmers ultimately so stay tuned as of next week we'll share all the links and we'll also keep everyone that is registered informed in case there are new webinars or in case there's anything more ongoing on this topic all of those of you who signed up and who are in our database will also be informed of that thank you all also, I know that it was quite last minute that we pulled some of these things together, but I would appreciate again all of you coming and sharing your expertise. And have a nice weekend and for the Christians have a nice Easter next week. Thank you and goodbye everybody. Thank you to everybody.